Howdy and welcome to Daily Miles. Do me a solid if you would. Click that like button down below and while you're at it, hit that subscribe button for more content. On today's agenda, another tango story. To hear a few more of these, or if you'd just like to skip the story and just watch and hear the ocean sounds, click the links down below in the description. Today's tango story is about a woman named Peggy. Peggy is actually a made up name. She's the representation of seven different women. Actually, truth be told, a whole bunch of women. All with the exact same two problems, which we'll get to in just a moment. This tango story is about a tango intensive. Peggy came to me as most students do, after dancing with their future teachers. During the first song, Peggy immediately realized that I was a teacher because of how smooth I felt, how clear I was, and how easy it was for her to dance with me, as she would later tell me. After the first song ended, she felt embarrassed for her dancing skills, as she indicated to me. I reassured her that I wasn't judging her abilities as a dancer, and no teacher should do that while you're dancing with them socially. As the tanda progressed, Peggy verbally apologized frequently when she felt like she missed something that I led. Side note, in Argentine tango, a tanda is three or four songs by the same orchestra in the same style of music, tango, vals, or milonga. And when you agree to a dance with somebody at a milonga, not a practica, you're agreeing to a dance with that person for the entire length of the tanda, not just the song. Moving on. I didn't respond to her apologies, I just kept going because I don't like to talk while I'm dancing with somebody. Your dancing is your talking, I felt. However, I would frequently modify my dancing, drop beats, slow things down for her, and adjust to her abilities, which is what I believe any good dancer should do. I never forced her or used my arms or hands to push, pull, squeeze, or create compression as a way to control her or to communicate my ideas to her. I was an intention-based dancer. Intention-based dancing, as opposed to its direct opposite, and the more popular idea that a lot of people use is compression-based dancing, which is where you do use your arms and your hands, even in a minimal way, to communicate your ideas through compression, squeezing, or physical pressure to push and or to pull, and to communicate your ideas. As a matter of historical fact, every time that she would use her arms, her hands, or use me to stabilize herself to communicate the completion of an idea, I would reset the embrace, which would then force her to do exactly the same thing. By the end of the tanda, she asked how she could get in touch with me, and I told her that I didn't conduct business at a milonga because A, it was somebody else's milonga, and B, it was impolite. So after the milonga, outside, she found me and we exchanged information, rates, and availabilities. I need to back up here a bit and explain that my first private lesson with a potential student was two hours in length, which may sound like a lot, but as you'll see, there's a reason why. The first 20 minutes of my lesson was a skills assessment of them walking forwards, backwards, and performing ochos, molinetes, and crosses without me, all the while I was shooting video from two different angles. Once that was done, I would then dance with them as a lead or as a follower, the opposite role of what they were currently dancing, and again, videoing the whole thing. Then I would sit them down and watch everything that we had just shot and then analyze what I saw. Usually this would take anywhere between 40 and 45 minutes just to go through it all. This was done so that I could show them what their foundation looked like without me in the equation. And then as well, what their dancing appeared like using common vocabulary. I, then again, with me in the equation. My reason for doing it this way was two things. One was to have them assess their own abilities with my guidance, what they saw. Instead of us looking in a mirror as we were dancing, which they would frequently miss these things. And two, to create a baseline of their abilities, a starting point should they wish to continue studying with me. They could see where they were and what had changed over time. The remainder of the time in the lesson would focus on the one thing I felt they needed to adjust or to work on in their foundation that was sorely missing, which was generally how they were walking. If they paid for a full video analysis, I would then go home and create a fuller analysis of their skills and abilities and then send them off to them via Google Drive. Peggy, remember her? Peggy did all of this and paid for the works. Usually by the end of that lesson, one of two things happened. They either never wanted to see me again or they saw the value of what I, what I was on about and wanted more. Peggy experienced the latter. She liked my rigorous approach and it was clear to her that her issues lay in her foundation. Peggy had been dancing for about seven and a half years at the time I came across her. 
She'd been to Buenos Aires and studied with everyone, but her dancing had stalled. Something wasn't right. She just didn't know what that was. She couldn't quite put her finger on it, but Peggy believed that she suffered from all, what a lot of dancers suffer from after their basics classes. Her foundation was poorly executed. She had gotten to a point where, her, where she stopped asking for and hearing feedback from reputable dancers and figured that since nobody was complaining anymore, that she must be doing okay. But clearly that wasn't the case when she danced with me. Something was off, as she said. She could follow anyone, she said, but they only danced a single tondo with her, and never again after that. She sat most nights at her local milonga, which led to her second problem. She believed that she had acquired tango baggage, which is the reputation of how someone executes the dance. Put another way, tango baggage is all the moves that got her to where she was at, so much so that everyone could see that stuff coming a mile away, which is to say that everyone knew what they were about to get with her. Early on, she liked to believe that it was the leads that she was dancing with that wouldn't dance with her anymore. They were snobby, rude, and only wanted to dance with the young, pretty girls. That became less true as time went on, as older, more experienced dancers would react the same exact way. I should point out that Peggy was only dancing the role of the follower and had no desire at that time to understand the role of the lead and its importance it played in her ability to follow. Furthermore, like most followers, Peggy was pro-offered following tips and advice from leads that didn't follow on a regular basis. Most, if not all, of the male leads that she had danced with had never followed socially and or in a pair of heels. After her first lesson, Peggy signed up for my level one intensive, which was a review and a deep, deep, deep dive of all the foundation that a dancer needs, plus all the vocabulary that one is commonly uses, all completely deconstructed, all within a 12 week period, three days a week, alternating between one leading session and one following session. And each session was 1.5 hours in length. There was just one little tiny problem, as Peggy saw it. She was in her 60s, and she wasn't a spring chicken anymore. She said, and I quote, I got one foot in the grave and the other one moving in that direction, unquote. She felt like she wouldn't be able to devote the necessary energy and time to it. She said, I tried for a while, unquote. I had a rule. There were no refunds, which meant she paid up front for the entire series. As a result, her, quote, trying it, unquote, could mean that she'd walk away if she didn't like it or felt overwhelmed. At the same time, she was reluctantly learning how to lead. At first she was, well, there's no nice way to put this, she was downright rude about it. She saw no purpose in learning to lead. She mouthed the words and went through the motions, but she just saw nothing in it for her. She was at a practica with me and she'd been leading another woman around the room at my insistence because that was part of her homework. She stepped off the floor, thanked her partner and came over to me all excited. She explained that she finally saw what she was doing all this time in somebody else because of how difficult it was to lead that person. After that, she never questioned leading or the program. In fact, she leaned into it hard. She wanted more leading than she actually did following. She came to each session with a smile and a hard work ethic. And she would leave sometimes with a furrowed brow, all sweaty and sometimes upset with herself. I reassured her that this was normal, that she was unlearning a lot of her habits and getting at the root of her problems. Little by little, poco a poco, day by day, week after week, she began to change, slowly at first, and then seemingly by magic, by leaps and bounds. Her balance had improved, her stability was near perfect, and she had stopped using her arms and her hands. Her embrace became light as a feather and extremely hypersensitive, which was a byproduct of the training. Truthfully, she began to hear things in my lead that only my long-term intensive students heard. She actually called me out a few times on my following skills and technique. One day she came to class in tears. I sat her down and asked why she was crying. I already knew the reason why because most of my students came to the same place. I just didn't tell her that. I just listened and waited for what I knew was coming. She realized that she couldn't dance with these people any longer. I asked who she meant by these people and why she felt that way. And she said it was because now she was hearing and feeling all the pushing and pulling that had been going on for years with a lot of her partners and it was driving her absolutely crazy now. I reminded her that A, these people are her friends and B, she had to live here, I didn't. I calmed her fears and told her there were other places in the world for her to go and dance, where that didn't happen as much, that there were other leads that didn't use her as a tango pinata for their tango dreams. She smiled, wiped her tears, and then got back to work. Another month went by, and while her dancing had improved, it had plateaued, according to her, or so she thought. She actually started going backwards, reverting to her earlier form, according to her. I asked her why she felt that way after one lesson, and her response was telling. 
All of my students went through the same exact phase. If they came out the other side, they'd be better for it. She said, Miles, I was frustrated with my dancing. I just didn't know it. I couldn't do anything right. You showed me that I wasn't doing anything right. So I just basically gave up after a while. I asked her if she had a month to take a trip with me. She asked why, and I said, because I want to show you something. She did have the time and the money, so I planned a trip with her, made arrangements to take her to a few places where I knew she would be asked to dance and to dance with a whole range of dancers that had the exact same mindset. I stopped her studies and we got on a transport and then got to our first stop a few weeks later. At that first milonga, I danced with her just to show her off. Then I introduced her to a whole range of leads, one by one, and didn't tell them that I was her teacher. They danced with her and boy did they ever. She danced nonstop the entire night, she told me. I never saw her once after that, truthfully. She never caught her breath and she never sat, so she said. Over the course of the next month, she went from milonga to milonga to milonga. Every night for 30 days, the exact same thing. Near the end of the trip, I got her into a tango marathon. At the marathon, after the opening day and night, she was sitting next to me watching the floor and not much conversation was happening between us. And then out of the blue, she said this to me. Miles, I understand it now. I asked her what she understood. And she said, I understand why you teach what you teach. These milongas, these milongas are all those places that you told me about. These people dance exactly the way that you've been talking about. I asked her, she liked it. And her response was, I don't know. Our travels ended and she went back home. And I stayed as I had lessons to do. I traveled on to Buenos Aires and then back to her home country, whereupon I saw her again. She hadn't finished her intensive yet, so we still had lessons to do if she wanted them. She said she did, and we made arrangements to meet later on. She walked in all happy and smiling. I asked her what she was all happy about, and she told me that for the last few weeks, she'd been dancing with one of the better local dancers, and not just once, but two or three times a night several, for the last several weeks, which led to other local leads asking to dance with her. What had changed was her foundation, which changed her tango baggage, which changed her dancing experience. All right, that's all from the Tango Story Land today. I appreciate your time, your patience, and your patronage. If you like this stuff, smash that like button down below. And while you're down there, hit the subscribe button for more content. Thanks a bunch for watching Daily Miles.